Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again to another video where we're going to be looking back at an older video. In this case, my original video review of Tomorrow Never Dies, which I removed from the channel a little while back, and uh, thus it became Lost Media. And don't just take my word for it, if you go to lostmediawiki.com, you will find a page that talks about how I removed those original videos from this channel. I have no idea if this is AI generated or if someone is updating this. If you are updating it and you're watching this video, thank you very much for uh, holding my feet to the fire and ensuring that I will never be able to delete another video again. I do quite love the uh, inclusion of this line uh, explaining why I deleted those old videos off the channel in the first place. Each upload featured an introduction where Dyson explained that he was not satisfied with the videos due to their low quality and his wooden performance. Which is entirely true, obviously, but uh, no need to rub it in. Just before we move on, I want to say that I have no clue how I got these particular targeted ads. I can confirm I have not been searching for adult dummies or whatever that thing is. Anyway, yes, today we're looking back at the original video review for Tomorrow Never Dies. I'm looking at this one specifically because recently I uploaded a new big deep dive review for the film and I always find it interesting to look back on these original ones and see what opinions stayed the same, what changed, any recurring gags, any uh, notable observations. With this one I definitely know that there's going to be a familiar gag or two. There were some that really stuck in my mind over the years and I know that I repeated them in the most recent in-depth video review, and I think that overall it is going to be very positive. This is a Bond film that I have loved since I first saw it, so I have no doubt that this review is going to be incredibly positive. Um, but I'm still curious to see if there's going to be any significant changes with how I feel about it now compared to this, which was over ten years ago now. Hello once again and welcome to another edition of My Weekly Bond. This week we're going to be looking at the second Pierce Brosnan Bond film, Tomorrow Never Lies. I mean, uh, dies. Tomorrow Never Dies. On with the film. Yeah, that was a reference to... This is a rumour that's gone around the internet uh, at Bond fan pages for a long time. Uh, the idea that the film's original title was going to be Tomorrow Never Lies, and that there was a typo or something someone was sending through a fax to MGM and because of a typo or a bit of ink getting on the paper or whatever uh lies became dies on the paper and the MGM executives were like aha that's a great idea for the title let's do that um it's one of those things that I can never remember I'm fairly sure that it's been dis proven, discredited, or whatever, like, it never actually happened. Um, but it's one of those things that I, I, I see the rumour resurface so much that I can never actually remember if it's true or not, because it's perpetuated so much. Um, I, I'm leaning more towards the side of it not being true. I'm fairly sure that that's been confirmed, but I can't remember exactly where. Uh, anyway, that's what that little opening gag was about. So we get the gun barrel sequence and we're thrown right into MI6 and the British military watching footage taken by Bond at a terrorist arms bazaar. It's here we're introduced to M's chief of staff, Charles Robinson, played by Colin Salmon. I guess he must job share with Bill Tanner then. Tana. And we're also introduced to Admiral it's Roebuck Tana. here, played by Jeffrey Palmer. As MI6 are identifying a load of terrorists, we're introduced to Henry Gupta, played by Ricky Jay, who is plot point buying a GPS encoder. The Admiral fires a missile at the bazaar when Bond spies some nuclear torpedoes and must leap into action to move them before the Admiral's missile hits. Filthy habit. Okay, that's a bit rich coming from James Bond, the man who, according to Ian Fleming, is living let die, smokes 20 cigarettes a day. But then I guess, you know, this is the 1990s, we can no longer have our heroes smoking because that's terribly on PC, bro. <laughs> After some good action and excellent score music from David Arnold, Bond escapes with the missiles as we go into this film's title sequence. The title sequence is probably my favourite of the whole series, and I really like the Sheryl Crow theme song. No, 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 wait, wait, it's a good song. It is a good song. By the way, I Favorite guess I should probably series. talk about this here. The title for this film has always been a great source of bafflement for me. I mean, yeah, Carver's newspaper in the film is called Tomorrow, but why would it never die? 
Besides, presumably it does die as, well, spoiler alert, Carver dies at the end of the film. Apparently it was a typo that led to this film being called Tomorrow Never Dies, as the title was originally supposed to be Tomorrow Never Lies, which would have made more sense in the context of the film, but it doesn't really sound as good as Tomorrow Never Dies, which, if taken literally, sounds like Bond would be preventing global annihilation or something like... Me perpetuating that rumour that I was talking about earlier there? Huh, interesting. It, it, in quite a short video, this one's only like 14 minutes, 30 seconds long. Um, really, it's kind of curious that I took the time out to expand on that. Anyway. That, but as that's really got nothing to do with this film, it just comes off as a bit of a puzzling title. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Uh, back to the film. So after the titles, we see a British frigate in trouble with some Chinese fighter jets because apparently they're in Chinese waters, but they say they're not. <laughs> Gupta's GPS thing. <coughs> Cough. We're then introduced to this film's henchman in the form of Stamper, played by, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, but I'm going to say it anyway, Gotz Otto, who is this film's tall, blonde, muscular, assassin type character. A tall, blonde, muscular assassin, eh? Well, we've never had one of those before in a Bond film. Stamper is using a stealth boat to sneak about in the water and uses a sea vac drill to sink the British frigate and shoots down one of the MiGs. All this sinking ship stuff is reminding me of another film that was released in 1997 involving sinking boats, but I just can't remember which. Oh well, it clearly can't have been that good if I can't remember it, so let's continue, shall we? Three generators are down, sir. You know, I haven't rewatched Titanic in a long time. So we're now down 14 degrees by the scale. Oh Christ, that's Gerard Butler. Going to have to uh, mark the film down for that one. <laughs> Eventually, the crew of the frigate abandoned ship. The survivors are then shot by Stamper. We're then introduced to this film's main villain, Rupert Murdoch. I mean, I, I, sorry, I mean Elliot Carver, played by Jonathan Price, who is absolutely wonderful in this film. Hold the presses. This, just in. By a curious quirk of fate, we have the perfect story with which to launch our satellite news network tonight. It seems... The sound on this is, it seems a lot echoier than what I'm used to. I don't know if that's an editing mistake on my part or what. I want magazine stories. I want books. I want films. I want TV. I want radio. I want us on the air. I think this will have been uh, from the special edition print of the film. Uh, maybe I'm just used to the Blu-ray mix of the soundtrack. But Hear it and read about it from the Carver huh. Media Group. There's no news. Like bad news. Wow! That eyebrow raising is absolutely magnificent! I can only aspire to reach such levels of eyebrow raisingness. <laughs> Anyway, turns out Carver masterminded the frigate sinking so he could report it in his newspaper tomorrow first. As this is suspicious, Bond is sent to Hamburg to attend the launching of Carver's new TV channel, where Bond bumps into Carver's wife and old flame, Paris, played by Terry Hatcher. <sighs> when did this film turn into a soap opera? It's also this scene where we're introduced to this film's Bond girl, Wei Lin, played by Michelle Yeoh. I'm thinking of getting Wei Lin behind a news desk. That's wonderful. I'm sure she won't resist too much. <clears throat> That's a bit awkward. When did this film turn into Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? <laughs> Carver gets annoyed at Bond mingling with his wife, so has been <laughs> taken into a back room and beaten up while Carver delivers his speech. I thought that was a good reference. What do I expect in return? Worldwide domination. Oh, well, uh, at least he's up front about his plans. Bond escapes, of course, and later has a rendezvous with Paris, who tells Bond how to get into Carver's headquarters and steal back the GPS encoder. I'll Incurda. say here that I really love the idea behind Paris Carver. Uh, that is, you know, Bond meeting up with a previous conquest, and to be honest, at the rate he's been going, I'm amazed it's taken him 18 films to finally bump into someone he's shagged in the past. However, I think it would have been really, really cool to have an actual Bond girl from the past play this role. Carrie Lowell, for instance. It would have given the series a nice bit of continuity, and I'd have really liked it. Anyway, Carver learns of Bond and Paris's past from Gupta, who recorded the pair on CCTV. Tell me, James, do you still sleep with a gun under your pillow? I think we should set an appointment for my wife with the doctor. Gynecologist by any chance? <laughs> She's definitely gonna need a checkup after sleeping with Bond. 
<laughs> the next day, Bond breaks into Gupta's office and safe to retrieve the encoder. Well, Gupta sure does like his pawn. <laughs> Bond gets the encoder and bumps into Waylin, who sets off an alarm and it's action galore in the printing place. Ah yes, I know that there's a gag coming up that I definitely repeated in my updated video. Well, I guess we found the answer to the question what's black, white and red all over. They'll print anything these days. Oh, um, yeah, that too. That's like, genuinely, for the longest time, uh, whenever I would watch Tomorrow Never Dies, I genuinely always thought he was gonna say, what's black, white, and red all over, like, some play on that. And it, it always used to catch me by surprise when he actually says it's still print anything these days. Um, now I know that it's not coming, but back then, certainly, I was always, like, a little bit taken aback. Oh, you didn't say that thing that I thought you were gonna say. We then get one of my favourite versions of the James Bond theme. Ah, yes. Still to this day, one of my favourites. Ah, oh, I love it. If only Calvin back then knew he would have this on soundtrack someday. <laughs> soundtrack CD. Before we see Bond arrive back at his hotel to see Paris Carver dead in his bed. Very sad, yes, but hold on to your hats, folks. The best thing in the film is coming up. I have a clear shot at your head, Mr. Bond. Best thing in the film, apparently. Stand up, slowly. Drop your gun and kick it toward me, yeah? Yes, it's Dr. Kaufman, played by Vincent Schiavelli, who is so freaking good and really isn't on screen for as long as he should be. I mean, he's so ridiculously campy and silly, yet manages to remain quite creepy and threatening. Schiavelli knows he's in a Bond film and he's having fun with it. Anyway, Bond kills the Doctor. <laughs> Before using his Q branch remote control BMW to escape the villains in a wonderful action sequence in a multi story car park before rendezvousing with Jack Wade at an American airbase. Just glossed over one of the best action sequences in the series. Though. You know when I say I really like Sheriff Pepper in his first film, but not so much in the second film? Kind of how I feel about Jack Wade here. I mean, seriously, he's just a loud buffoon in this film, whereas in Goldeneye he seemed very grounded and quite interesting. Anyway, Bond is dropped into the South China Sea to investigate the sunken British frigate, where he sees a missile is missing and bumps into Wei Lin. They're captured by Stamper and taken to Carver, where we get more delightful hamming from Jonathan Price before the pair escape and we get lots more action before Wei Lin reveals her high tech arsenal at her base where the pair team up to take down Carver. You could I'll send the messages. Blasted through about 45 minutes worth of the film there. Hmm. Second thoughts, you type. Hang on a minute. I think I'm having another flashback. Oh, oh, oh my. Oh. <laughs> Instant Japanese. You may need it. You forget I took a first in Oriental languages at Cambridge. Hmm. Clearly, Cambridge isn't all it's cranked up to be. Yes, it turns out Waylin is some Chinese secret agent, or something, and has also been investigating Carver. Bond spies a gun he quite likes in Waylin's armory. Ah, the new Walther. How's Q to get me one of these? Oh my god, does this mean there's gonna be no more Walther PPK? Oh, <laughs> Oh, I remember this. A little montage. No. <laughs> with some just clearly Google searched uh, images of the Walther PPK. Right, right, uh, right, enough of that. God, I hate montages to that song, it's so overdone. Anyway, uh, Bond and Wei Lin find Carver's stealth boat. With ease, really, considering it's a stealth boat. And, well, anyway, stuff happens uh, over the next half hour. Uh, highlights of which are all stuff involving Jonathan Price saying things, really. Stamper to bridge. Bond. Dead. Delicious. Oh, Mr. Stamper, would you please kill those bastards? And it seems you outlived your contract. <laughs> I like an audience. Let the mayhem begin. God, Jonathan Price really does have all the best lines in this film. You quite like The that. man is God. Jonathan anyway, Price supercut. Jonathan Price saying and doing all things awesome. We learn of his dastardly plan to provoke a war between China and the UK using the missiles he stole from the sunken frigate to blow up China's political leaders, making it like the British did it. And, um, what exactly is in this for you, Elliot? Just exclusive broadcasting rights in China for the next hundred years. 
Ah, yes, well, uh, good a reason as any, I guess. Bond and Waylin blow up the place for the next 20 minutes, Bond eventually killing Carve with the sea vectoral and saving the day by blowing up Stamper with the stolen missiles and getting off with Waylin on the wreckage of the stealth boat as the British Navy search for them. And so that's how the film ends. But ooh, do stick around for the end credits for this one as it features an amazing Bond song on the end called Surrender by KD Lang which features several themes that were used throughout the film and was indeed intended to be the film's title song. But because this is more marketable than this, we have this terrific song on the end credits when it should really be at the front of the film. Don't get me wrong, I think the Sheryl Crow one is great too, but Surrender just has uh, so much more of a Bondy feel to it and KD Lang is such an amazing powerful singer. It's a shame to see this song stuck at the back of the film, but I suppose we should just be thankful that it's here at all, really. Perhaps I should explain now why in the last review I referred to thinking of this film as Brosnan's Octopussy. Well, in my Octopussy review I commented on how even though Octopussy isn't my favourite Bond film, I've probably seen it more than any other, and every time I day. just want to relax in front of a good Bond film, I'll always almost go for that one. Well, it's a very similar case with Tomorrow Never Dies in that I've seen it, well, an awful lot, which is odd. I mean, I prefer Goldeneye much more. I even prefer uh, The World Is Not Enough, really. But Tomorrow Never Dies is always my go-to Brosnan Bond film, just like Octopussy is for Roger Moore for me. And uh. I have no idea why. I guess I just find them to be the most watchable. Maybe, maybe I like them because they're both very... I don't want to say run-of-the-mill because that sounds derogatory, but they're certainly the more standard kind of Bond adventure in that they really tick all the boxes on the list, but they do it in such a fun and entertaining way that I can't help but really love them. Tomorrow Never Dies features a wonderful villain in Elliot Carver, and I always feel like Jonathan Price is really overlooked when it comes to best Bond villain ever polls, because he's so damn good in this film, same with Vincent Chiavelli as Dr. Kaufman to be honest. Stamper is an acceptable physical henchman villain in the Red Grant mould, but he hardly stands out. Gupta too hardly stands out, but I'd highly recommend watching the deleted scenes of Gupta on the Ultimate Edition DVD as they really do give him a surprising amount of character in such a short space of time, including giving him a odd little card throwing gimmick. Michelle Yeoh is terrific as Wei Lin and I really do love Terry Hatcher as Paris Carver but I oh. guess I've already talked about Paris so I'll move on. All the MI6 regulars are great but I'll say I really like newcomer Colin Salmon as Charles Robinson. If someone had to replace Michael Kitchen then I'm glad it's this chap. I think I really love almost all of the action sequences in this one, particularly the printing work stuff and the BMW stuff. I will say that I think the motorbike chase goes on just a bit too long and Probably, uh, same with all the stuff at the end on Carver's stealth ship. By the way, how fucking big is Carver's stealth boat? I mean, it doesn't look that big from the outside, and when Bond and Waylin are underneath it, it doesn't look that big, yet inside it's a veritable labyrinth. Huh. I also really, really, really love new composer David Arnold's score. I love all of Arnold's Brosnan scores, though. He does a terrific job at modernising the Bond music, but retaining some of its John Barry past, which is all good with me. So yes, Tomorrow Never Dies, it's just a really enjoyable, great Bond film. So what if it's a bit run-of-the-mill and comes across as being just another instalment in the Bond franchise? It does it brilliantly, and like I say, I always come back to this one whenever I just want a relaxing evening watching a Pierce Brosnan Bond film. So it certainly has lasting value, well, for me anyway. And I'm happy to say that the uh, good Brosnan Bond stuff continues with me for the next film, so expect yet another love fest when we return next week for the 19th James Bond film, The World Is Not Enough. The couple of things that surprised me there in that wrap-up was there was a shot in the trailer of uh, Michelle Yeoh coming through a door that I'm fairly sure is not in the film that I don't remember clocking before. Um, secondly, uh, such praise for Terry Hatcher, which I'm surprised at by past self about. I don't ever recall loving that character, but at this time Desperate Housewives will have still been airing and I will have still been watching it, so I imagine that I would have had a lot more goodwill for Terry Hatcher then than I might do now. But yeah, otherwise universally positive as I was expecting. Um, I still use that, you know, that and Octopussy is still my go-to Bond films if I just want a relaxing time with a Bond adventure, so it's, uh, yeah crazy how that hasn't changed in over 10 years. As always, please do let me know your own thoughts on this older video in the comment section below. And also below you can find links to my various social media pages and there's also the subscribe button and the Mrs. Bell notification button. So please do click those if you want to stay super up to date on future video uploads. And with all that being said, and until next time Bond fans, so long for now.